And we're live. This is a banner day. I've got two legends on. And this is through the suggestion of Scott Rouse and Greg Hartley. I can't remember who said it. I know they both agreed. So I'm going to credit both of them. When uh, Peter Hyatt was on with them before, they were saying, hey, um, Eric, you've got to get Peter on with James Pyle because Jim Pyle is a master interrogator. Mm -hmm. You teach interrogation. You've taught it forever. And obviously you do other elements as well, but you're mostly an interrogator mm -hmm. and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong on any of it. Peter Hyatt is a statement analyst. And conceptually, we're looking at an entire, I guess, process or procedure, right? Where you have um, somebody who's getting information from people and you have somebody else who's interpreting the information from people. How are you guys doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to be here with you and your listeners. All right. Well, thank you. Now, would you guys agree with that analysis or that you could be seen sort of as a spectrum, like one collecting the information, the other analyzing behind? I well, think that, uh, yeah. yeah, you have to have both. <laughs> uh, if an investigator takes a statement first and I get the statement, I then give it to the interviewer interrogator um, with the analysis, which, you know, which areas will show deception, which areas show sensitivity, that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes even depending on the, the recipient questions for them. It's, they take from there, though. Okay, so, yeah, I, I would love to get down to the procedure, and I, I will tell you, I'm I'm flying blind because I, I don't really know this myself. I haven't done it. And I think it would be a rare opportunity to just learn. Like, you had mentioned, Peter, that you're taking statements and different things and giving it to the investigator or whoever's talking to him. Um, is it then almost a back-and-forth conversation on the side where – they ask, you get information, then you they follow up? It, it can be. Um, sometimes the investigator will come and join the team of analysts and will work uh, on the statement five or six hours worth of time, and that investigator will then go off with it. But I'm really, at this point, I'm fully behind the scenes, and uh, they're the ones that are doing the work. Okay, now, Jim, have you worked with um, statement analysis in this regard? I think you've worked with uh, Jack Schaefer, right? Uh, yes, Jack Schaefer, Avinam Sapir, uh, other folks in, in over the years. Uh, and the, the statement analysis is most interesting to me. Uh, we, we see, we hear. And uh, that those are have to be congruent. And that's why the body language behavior panel guys just keep me riveted because that visual part, is great, but without the congruency of what is said and how it's said, and in, in written statement analysis, uh, I like that really great too, because then you can really, you know, get all you can get from it, from how they say what they say. So it's really a, an amalgam of all this stuff, and uh, you have to be able to just really uh, relax into it, absorb it, be a part of it, and uh, I, I joined the Army back in a peacetime, and uh, I was an interrogator student back in 1984. And uh, the, the term master interrogator, uh, I'm not that. I'm just uh, another one of the guys that have done what we've done, where we do it, and how we do it. But, uh, but I've trained interrogators ever since 1987. From that point on, I've been teaching human intelligence collection. So I'm an experienced uh, interrogator, interrogator. Well, I, I'm going to stand by the title. I, I think I'm okay calling you a master interrogator. I understand your humility, but I, I think uh, I think it can hold up. You only have uh, 30 years plus doing it. Eh, maybe. Okay. Maybe, okay. maybe. Maybe. Maybe you qualify. I don't know. What do you think, Peter? I think so. That's a lot. <laughs> All right. No more arm wrestling with you guys. <laughs> All right. So now, um. Peter, th this is where I think it'd be really interesting. When you're trying to do statement analysis, are you looking for information asked in a way to get you? I, I'm trying to I'm trying to put this into words correctly, but I, I worry sometimes, you know, that people don't always understand what the other one needs to be able to see. Like you they have to ask the right questions in order for you to have something to analyze well is that a fair question yes and 
uh, departments that have this training, the, someone who responds first, even sometimes even patrol, um, will ask uh, the person to write out what happened without giving anything information to them. It then goes to me, I give the analysis to the investigator, the one that's assigned to it, and he or she is going on that, and hopefully the, the analysis is helpful. But they still have to rely upon their experiences, their instincts at the time, the ability to read someone quickly. Mm -hmm. So it, it's their talent. It, this is just a background work. Is that actually preferable then, that they just say, uh, write down what happened and, and nothing else, no interaction beyond that, and get it for you? In the first response, yes. That is, that is If it can be done, that's best. There have been times where, um, and this is years ago for me, where I've conducted an interview after taking a written statement and taking a 10 minute break and quickly going back and analyzing the statement as quickly as I can and then going out. Because one of the things I, I always count on is I try to use the subject's language, not my own. Mm. Like what they're familiar with, not, not something introducing to them. That's a really good point. And um, Jim, and I'll, I'll go to you on that. I, I know talking to Greg as well, how do you like to approach a, the situation? And I, I like that Peter mentioned language because that's kind of come up lately, um, especially with the behavior panel and Greg Hartley and talking about uh, Don Wells, Summer Wells' father, for example, that he speaks in a manner that is very different than the way I speak, the way I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and the way many others grew up, it's a very regional thing. It's of a lifestyle. He um, had problems with the law. He spent a lot of time in some prison mm -hmm. and talking to him, you have to kind of take all this into account. Absolutely. Everybody has a norm and people from Southern California in New York city, uh, does they don't communicate the same. And there, there's, there's challenges there uh, from the Midwest, from the South, anywhere and everywhere. You have to be sensitive to who that person is, what that person's experience are. Uh, and, you know, you can't know everybody and everything, but just be aware that people talk different, people think different. And you have to be able to really understand that they're not thinking the way you think, talk the way you think, but you need to understand how they talk, how they think. And if you have time, that's great. If you're in a situation where time is not on your side, that doesn't serve you well. But uh, certainly, uh, I like to go strictly uh, discovery. Uh, what happened? Why are you here? What's going on? And even if I got a, a screening report, something that tells me a little bit about the person and the environment, I'm not going to try to prove that to be true while talking with them. I'm going to lay that aside and let my discoveries start the conversation, and then I'll check that to see if there's veracity or, or not. And, uh, you know, uh, finding out a, a person that's lying, that's the easy part. Finding out the why the lie, that's the tough part. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Um, on that, um, and I've, I've, I try to do interviews and things like that. I do this right now. I mean, this is very informal. I'm just learning from you guys. Mm -hmm. um, is the theory that you walk in and you're not an adversary, either of you, um, that you just literally just are talking to them. You're not judging, you're only collecting. Yes. And Peter, I don't know how that works with you because are you speaking to them directly or is there almost always somebody in between? No, um, I just don't speak directly. I don't do as many interviews as I used to do. Um, when I worked for the state in uh, child protective and uh, child abuse allegations, that was direct interviewing. But also here, there's another um, rather easy layer is the 911 call. I get the transcript early. I'm able to um, oftentimes glean quite a bit from that. I can help with the investigation. But again, I'm, it's not proof. It's just a tool. The, the investigator has to do that work. Uh, th th that actually brings up a good question. 911 calls seem to be very important in all of your lines of work. Is that a case that the, the closer you can get to the incident, the, the better the information? Like, like it's almost like fruit that's going to spoil over time or it might shift or change due to external influences? 
we view it as a, a form of non-legal but um, excited utterance where there's an expectation with an emergency call. And one of the things that um, law enforcement likes to have from us is in that 911 call, first of all, is this a guilty caller or is, it, or is the caller telling the truth? And that's generally pretty easy to discern. But then we look for details, including priority, um, at times, we're even able to pinpoint, for example, the time of death mm. based upon the description by the, the caller, the guilty caller. So it can be very time-saving for uh, law enforcement as they go there. That moves on to them again. They're the ones that will testify to their findings. So they still have to do that work. Okay, now by, by guilty caller, um, and I'll, I'll go to Jim, but I definitely want to hear from Peter on this too. Um, that could be a wide ranging term, right? Because you're not necessarily saying they are guilty of whatever is happening at the time. They may or may not have guilty knowledge. I, I, am I correct in that? That you're trying to find out, do they have guilty knowledge or more knowledge than they're necessarily stating? Not necessarily that they did it, but yeah. or did or whatever that they just, ha there's something there. Yeah, Eric, I, I got in trouble one night I was watching television with my good wife, and it was a crime. Is your bad one? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that opens that up. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I try to, to try to highlight her as much as I can. Uh, but uh, we were watching a crime show, and they opened the show with a nine one one call. Mm -hmm. And I told my wife, I said, I don't know. Who committed this murder? It was a murder show. It was already pre that, but this guy that called is involved. She mm. said, you can't, "She said you can't know that." I said, "I know that." And they spent the whole show trying to prove the 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 guiltiness of this person by by physical evidence. And I heard it audibly, without a question, that that this individual was involved, and he actually was the killer. And uh, again, the thing that I see so often is, is they usually provide too much information that's non-pertinent mm -hmm. to, the, to the real response. You know, I found a dead body here without, without you know, adding additional information. That's really all that's a matter that, that the 911 call should be about. But when they start presenting additional information unsolicited, that uh, gets my attention. I'm sure or a that, narrative, like yeah. I was coming home and this is yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of setting the story, kind of setting their innocence or their separation, whatever. But I, I pay attention really close to, to 911 calls. And I wish that Peter and I could talk to the 911 operators because I wish they could be more intuitive to question. It's really about what, where, and who, and not about how or why. And uh, mm. prior, uh, prior, if I could have a minute, the, the in military interrogation mission is to get pertinent, actionable information in a timely fashion. That might take hours, minutes, days, weeks. 911 caller has minutes to get the information, analyze the information, get a response on its way. And they are really the, the, the interrogators of uh, the civilian world and they their job is really fine focused and i wish that i could find a way to help them question a little more intuitively and it might be because they have legal things that they have to read these questions and all but boy i know that uh, if we could get them to to question more intuitively with what they hear and then get in those necessary elements of information i'd like to find out maybe how I might be able to help that. If somebody out there has a 911 connection to their job or to people that maybe uh, I could talk to, I'd like to begin that opening of that conversation. I can tell you from the experience that the um, dispatchers love training if they're able to get it. They love it. They, they're generally very dedicated and a lot mm -hmm. of them are very good at what they do. I've only had a few in each year for training, but they, Overall, they need it desperately, and uh, they often value it, too. You know, Eric, you mentioned before about um, a guilty call and what that means. I learned from a mistake uh, many years ago where a caller was deceptive 
in the call about his missing little girl and he didn't do it. A sex offender down the street did it. What I believe it turned out to be was that he was deceptive about what happened when she went missing because he was under the influence of drugs at the time, not watching her due to neglect. So I always step back and, and say, okay, I, I see guilt here, but I, it's difficult to uh, really pinpoint where it's coming from always. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a good a methodology where um, you just, you're just listening to clues that this is a good thing to follow up on? Again, not to judge it specifically, just to say something's here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, no, guilty. No. Something's here. Probably should just keep traveling down this this topic for a little while. Is that the way you guys handle that? Are we still in the context of nine one one calls, or um, we could be in context of um, anything? And actually, I've got Doctor Wood here, who is a an officer, a lot of experience, saying that we police are so used to hearing people say "trust me." And at least a bad outcomes for us. There's no way we would consider it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do the thing all the time that I want people to trust me. I say, really, with my hand over my heart. Well, that's that that will throw a lot of people off. But that's my way of confirming that what I'm telling you is true. But uh, that'll put a lot of people off. You know, honest to God, those kind of things uh, to to some people who who are uh, in questioning mode would would make them think that uh, the next thing I say is a lie. But uh, again, the norm for me and the norm for other people has to be determined. And uh, then from there, then you can go and look for the changes, anything that uh, changes from the norm. If I do this all the time and I say, really, this is what happened and I don't do that, that might be an indicator that what I'm telling you is different. But uh, hey, there's, there's so much to it that uh, it's just a matter of, of uh, your gut. Your, you know, I mean, we, we, we have been DNA'd for you know, uh, fight and flight, DNA for truth and, and lies. And uh, what we see and what we hear, the congruency then will make us follow uh, one this path or the other. So that's essentially a baseline. Do you have a, a baseline that you're doing, Peter? Well, I wanted to comment a little bit on that with um, the behavioral panel. I had only recently been introduced to them. And um, they were talking about Don Wells and before... I was able to hear what they had to say about that. I was concerned because I thought to myself, here's a guy with a long history of substance abuse, uh, prison, that sort of thing, depression. Um, he's using what I call uh, immature religious language as a cover and also as a diversion. Um, I found them to be remarkably restrained and they added all those factors in into their analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, taking that big picture, I have the luxury of a 911 call is printed out before me. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're going by in two minutes time. And I'm also, I also have the luxury of working with analysts around the country, Canada, Western Europe, uh, South Africa, all over the world every month. And I'm able to, especially with regionalism, gain some insight into expressions that I don't normally hear from where I am. Yeah, and that, that can be really, really um, challenging and difficult, especially as you're coming out and doing stuff publicly, because I, I'm sure you get pushback. You know, we're going to bring up the behavior panel a lot because I'm, I'm a huge fan, know the guys, all yeah. that, and we all watch them. <laughs> um, uh, they got a, a ton of flack with uh, the Brian Laundry, uh, you know, Gabby Petito. Um, analysis that they did of the uh, police you know body cam footage and i i don't feel like that that pushback was necessarily reasonable and i personally feel that we do a lot of projection very naturally and we have to watch it like you know i i'm you're so oh i'm sure such and such happened and then we like are arguing to an outcome versus arguing the path how how do you guys um, fight that tendency, or do you just not have it? It's completely washed out of your DNA. Um, Peter, I'll start with you. Um, someone asked me in a recent broadcast, uh, hey, Peter, you're a person of faith. Does your faith prejudice you? And I think that she was very surprised. I said, yes. So how do you hmm. combat that? Um, what I'm able to do 
and this is a privilege. I work with professionals, um, federal, state, uh, international, in law enforcement, and everyone has a different background. They have different experiences, many things that I've never experienced before. And so one of the things that we do during the team analysis session is that the statement is up and we're hitting it and going after it every which way is we call it pushback. Mm-hmm. We not so much playing the devil's advocate where someone does that personality driven, but um, for example, we will try to make excuses for every weird sensitive thing someone says, try to just, okay. and at the end of it, if we can't, we're probably looking at someone who's being deceptive and that serves us well, but that pushback is invaluable. Okay. And uh, Jim, I know you have faith. Uh, you're a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> so, so that I, I have my preferences for experience and for uh, interaction with people, but I try, I, I know my own. And so when I see something that makes me react, I say, okay, that's mine and not theirs. And I don't, I need to keep that neutral. And so it's, it's a hard thing to do sometimes. Uh, I know that we, we, with the Brian Laundry and with the uh, Summer Wells, I've thought of several th- scenarios that were totally out of the, the question as time came on. But I thought they were possibilities, and those mm-hmm. possibilities should be questioned, those possibilities should be looked at. And, and that's the purpose of, of, of thinking those things so that they either prove them or disprove them. It's scientific, I guess, in some element, but it's really just a matter of. Yeah, this is possible by experience. This is possible by uh, everybody that, that writes great novels has thought things beyond reality. And mm. so uh, you, you, you don't want to be in the box. You don't want to be outside the box. You just don't need the box. But uh, with that, I just try to make sure that I don't project my own and, 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 and overlay information and overlay opportunity with my preconceived notions. I, my, my preconceived ideas are just that, ideas, possibilities, and prove me wrong. No, fair enough. And I, I guess what frustrated me about it, and this is my own personal feelings, is that they had a piece of footage that they analyzed at, that was took place at this point in time, you know, before she was disappearing or whatever. Um, the cops had no knowledge of any of this. Nothing had happened at this point, no matter what. And you have to treat that as that period of time, not mm-hmm. with any um, further knowledge that you know, things like that. And I kept seeing over and over and over how they dropped the ball, they were making excuses, and that he was an obvious psychopath and sociopath. And it gets exhausting that people like to diagnose others into being a figure who's a psychopath, uh, psychopath, sociopath, whatever, which is a very specific diagnosis. One is not in the DSM, either one. They're part of antisocial personality. But also, and I'm putting this out there because you both have dealt with a lot of criminals and things like that. And I, from what I understand, not every criminal is a psychopath. As a matter of fact, it's only a minority of criminals or especially murderers who are psychopaths. Most are normal people who uh, go wrong or have problems. I don't know. Peter, do you have any thoughts? I do. Um, one of the things that was said about Brian Laundry was that he was a narcissist. And I decided to answer that a couple of days ago on a YouTube broadcast. And I said, um, in response to Brian Laundry being a narcissist who definitely won't kill himself because narcissists won't do that, I haven't found that to be true. First of all, I don't know that he's a narcissist. I don't know that he just didn't lose his temper. I have some opinions as I I watched the video uh, Mm -hmm. of him personally, Um, but I don't know until I get more information, um, especially his words, that helps me the most, that I could call him a narcissist. And then second of all, narcissists, you know, the extreme selfishness, when they are at the end of their rope, and they realize that the most important person in the world, in the universe, is themselves, who has now disappointed themselves, that utter, utter despair can lead to suicide. So I had said it, uh, I had felt, and it was my guess only, that I don't have his words, that I don't know if he's a, a narcissist or not, 
But as this thing wears on, he might take his own life, especially like if he hears any news broadcasts and you know, the body's been found and that sort of thing. If they, if they find out that, yes, he did kill himself, that they can determine that, uh, which it seems like that might be the case with the body they found and the, mm -hmm. the things around it, that, uh, that probably takes him out of the category of a psychopath as well because psychopaths have no, no guilt, no uh, respect for life other than their own. And uh, there aren't many psychopaths, I think, if we did some research, who are in the in the suicide mode? They're the ones that get caught later in life after fifty eight murders and such, and they're still going strong. So that uh, that might take him out of that realm where some people said he was a psychopath. I think he uh, was just uh, troubled. I think he the their relationship was very flawed and very troubled. And uh, when they put themselves together in that vehicle for that time, cabin concentrated, it came out. And so I'm not, a, I'm not a, I can't write this down and say this is so, but that's how I feel. Yeah. I, well, and I mentioned that, you know, living in a van together, especially young mm -hmm. and not emotionally capable of dealing with stress. Uh, there's something called cabin fever. It's been around yeah. a long time. <laughs> um, van and, fever in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, did and, you see um, the interview that was done by a protester rather rudely, but of the sister Cassie? Where, did you see I that? did. I saw no, it. Um, no. uh, the protesters were starting to get on my last nerve because I thought that they were abusive to uh, the family. Yeah. Um, especially in that case. Now, they did back off a little, and I think they came to their senses when she talked. Um, she seemed fine, squared away. I felt I felt bad for her, personally, but I don't, I don't have your expertise. Mm -hmm. She was telling the truth. She did not know initially, and the parents shut her down. So she wasn't able to ask and find out what happened. And that's when she knew something was wrong. And so she had even claimed at the end of that, and she was trying to de-escalate the, the protesters, that she had lost her own family. They threw her under the bus, her brother, and the, her kids lost their auntie, uh, Gabby. Mm -hmm. So she was, and, and she lost her, actually, somewhat of her freedom in the sense that people screaming outside your door with children in there is pretty rough. But I found her that she was truthful uh, in her denials. What are your um, thoughts on that? And I'll, I'll go with Jim. I, I'm very troubled with people following them around. Um, I, I feel it comes to the level of harassment. That's my personal feeling uh, of the parents. And whatever happens, that's between the parents and law enforcement. In my mind, they were communicating. They're using a lawyer. That's fine. People are upset about a lawyer, but that is his job. His job is not to go out there and hold hands or anything else. He was a very effective lawyer. Um, what is it about us as people that we think that we can just get involved and demand everything from everybody else? Yeah. Am I projecting too much into that? No, no, no. That's exactly what I see, and that's exactly how I feel about it. what. What? Who are they to be involved at all? And mm -hmm. what is their motive? What's What's their reason? What? Why do they have to ventilate and be such vitriol? I don't understand it. I, I, I I'm not that kind of guy. I, I, but I but I see it, and it's 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 a mob mentality, and people get fired up, and boy, it's, it doesn't take much to take that one step beyond. And uh, so that, that energy, when I see that energy, I'm, I'm troubled by that. And, and it's fostered a lot by media uh, from whatever, you know, news sells. And sometimes it's not news, it's, it's hype. And, Spectacle, uh, yeah. Yes. So that, you know, like that brings you uh, viewers and that brings you commercial dollars and such. So we have to understand the motives for all the things that happen. But I am not in that camp where people have to be part of everything that's going on and be personally involved with people who are troubled, who have troubles, who are uh, absolutely uh, most likely at their wit's end. Uh, there's, there's no human compassion there that I see. And uh, it's, it, it is a troubled state. 
Okay, and I got a question from Gavin Stone. This one's for Peter. Um, have you ever studied handwriting analysis? And do you think it can help you with handwritten uh, statements or alleged? I like how he said alleged suicide notes. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of experience in analyzing suicide notes. I've had a couple. And regrettably, I've been accurate with it. But that's from the language. But in terms of the handwriting, um, I had a marvelous experience years ago. Um, Steve Johnson, who you might know uh, from the interview room, he is mm -hmm. a, a certified handwriting analyst. He's also a statement analyst. He's a, he's a brilliant teacher. And we had a detective in Baltimore who asked us to uh, assist on a case where uh, a young woman legally uh, alleged to be raped, and it was a bizarre statement. Um, it was written as if it was uh, like a playwright would, would do it. Hmm. And what he wanted from us was some basic answers, but we went deeper. And I went into the, the profile of the personality type and that sort of thing. And I did this separately from Steve. Steve worked only on the handwriting. And the psychological profile that I worked up from the language matched the psychological profile that he worked up in the handwriting, which mm. matched is the local psychologist in um, Baltimore that had submitted that to the police, the three of them match. And so I had always been somewhat skeptical. I always found that years ago, um, handwriting analysts were always seemed to be very political. You could almost decide yeah. where they stood based on their analysis. Um, Steve changed my mind completely. And uh, I, I try to study a little bit, but I, I usually rely upon him. Great question. It, well, that is, that is fascinating on that. And <laughs> I imagine that's, that feels good and validating when, when everything's echoing. But have either of you run into the case where it's like, okay, one analysis, it really looks one way. Another analysis looks the other way. Or it's just, you know, it's just I, I feel like a lot of things can't be completely clear. Like they, they, there must be like a muddy middle in some cases. Have you dealt with that at all, Jim? Well, I, I want to talk maybe a couple different written uh, yeah. statements. Uh, Catherine Blasey Ford, her mm -hmm. written statement was with it was almost like a school student written statement on yellow paper uh, with scratch out corrections and it it didn't look like a statement that was from a person who's a who's a writer who's a, uh, a you know research person and stuff it didn't look like that and that was interesting to me I'm not going to say what what's what it is one way or the other, but it was interesting. It looked incongruent. Um, another statement was from uh, uh, the Ramsey family. You know the the statement in their house, the written statement in their house, three pages worth for a for a, a an abduction, quote unquote, later a murder, as we discovered within the day, and the fact that the Ramseys called their lawyer as soon as the body was brought upstairs. That's a con an interest, but the other statements that I have experienced with, and uh, with a member of my family in the military, who uh, made a uh, report of of a sexual harassment nature, uh, and she talked to me about it. I said, "Kittle, I just want to see your statement and the other person's statement," and I've had access to that. I was given access to that, and I read her statement and read his statement. And I said, it happened. A, if you think of an hourglass and you think of the perpetrator, he'll talk about every, this is my experience, we'll talk about a lot of things, but if it gets down to the incident, it gets real narrow. And then after that, broadens out, talk, talk, talk. If you talk to the victim, they talk not so much about everything going on, and it gets real broad about the event, the particulars, mm. and the, the feelings, and then it tapers down. So it's kind of like a reverse hourglass that fits together when the story's congruent 
uh, both stories come together to complement each other as to who's the perpetrator and who's the victim, almost to word numbers, percentages, some have proposed, uh, Avinam Sapir, for instance, uh, that, that you can almost do a formula. But all, uh, what I've seen is, uh, in experience, is the perpetrator will minimize and the victim will open up uh, more so about the event than the perpetrator. Uh, Peter, what do you think? Oh, I agree. The, um, the formula, I, I think, makes sense psychologically is that my introduction is going to be only a portion of what I'm saying. The actual events, the, the terrible thing that happened to me, that's going to be the majority of it. And then what happened after is going to be a smaller amount. Mm -hmm. So when we see that terribly imbalanced and we have all sorts of uh, detail that is unnecessary to give, and then the actual event is really shrunken down. We deem it, even on its form, counting words or counting lines, unreliable. And then we begin to dig from there. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. And, 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 I, and I should add, though, uh, Eric, mm -hmm. that uh, this this case went to court martial. And mm -hmm. that that's when I said, okay, now, you know, this is a serious issue. And it went to court martial. And my daughter, who represented herself, and the perpetrator represented by a lawyer, they went and she told her story just as it was with no lawyer representation. And that court martial resulted in the, this particular soldier being chaptered out of the U.S. Army so that it was convincing to them when I said, just tell your story. And, mm -hmm. um, and evidently that was the right outcome. Well, that actually would apply, you know, going to a callback to the 911 calls, right? In a 911 call, you shouldn't hear anything about leading up to the event or anything else. You should be hearing he's bleeding, she's bleeding, this is going on, help me. At like right. the only the hundred percent of the focus would be this particular problem, not the cause, not the mm -hmm. root, but just what's happening. Is that accurate? I think so. And 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 also sometimes the 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 excessive wailing and, and petitioning and and all that gets my attention too, that they're 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 really presenting themselves instead of the situation, and so uh, I, it, it is 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 a great interest to me uh, to listen to those calls. I wish I could be more helpful. Uh, Peter, what do you think? The um, I talked about a case last time with you, Eric, where a man came home and found his girlfriend and her seven year old son dead in a murder suicide. And in the 911 call, he said, two people just killed themselves in my house. Mm. That there showed not only the guilt, but also the motive in one sentence. I missed the motive at the time, and it eventually came out through further analysis. But he was blaming two people, his girlfriend, and he blamed a little six or seven-year-old boy for doing it too. And um, this was a, a case that, that I had described where the um, he passed his polygraph. He was cooperative. He, um, the coroner was satisfied. Everything was fine. Just one cold case detective was still bothered by it, who kept nudging for me to do that. And um, it was just his instinct. He was right. We ended up getting a conviction years later. Oh, nice. Nice. Hopefully you forced a confession, but... Um, and, and the tell on that was my house, right? Because he saw them as stealing his house. So the house elevated in importance and he got rid of the interlopers. What so had happened was he was um, a grifter. He went from woman to woman, moved into their house, and he was pestering her to sign him into the title deed. When mm. she refused, it was as if she signed her own death warrant. Mm. He had said, I'll never be homeless again. And so he, he killed her. Well, he's that's technically true. He has a new home. Mm -hmm. And, and um, <laughs> yeah, he probably will never be homeless, never leave it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On that note, actually, um, Peter, you sent something that you were going to go over. Uh, it was a job application. I thought it would be fun to kind of break up the language. And we were both talking about it. Oh, everybody's talking about it. Hold on. Let's see if I can add that here. 
All right. Now, can you tell us what this is and what it's about? Yeah, Jim, I think you'll you'll enjoy this. Um, this is similar to the the questionnaire, but it's designed for employment. So they're with businesses, they have a very difficult time with the constant changing of laws of what they can ask someone. So you, you can't ask an applicant, hey, if I hire you, are you going to use cocaine in the bathroom during your break? You can't, <laughs> can't ask that. And uh, here locally, it's just gotten a lot worse. But um, what the first question or the first imperative is for them is, please tell us everything you'd like us to know about you. Use the full page. I've, I've got it abbreviated here on the screen. Mm -hmm. So what someone does is they tell us who they are and why they're appropriate to be hired for the job. It is a low stress, you're home, you're not in front of an interview, you're, you're in your jammies, you're relaxed, and you sell yourself. I'm really good with customers. I work this job, I work that job, I've learned this, I've learned that. And generally speaking, um, when this is submitted to me, and I've had this one client for um, about eight years now, eight or nine years, when it's submitted, I presuppose this person is going to be interviewed, this person is going to be hired, unless they talk me out of it. And this one came in this past week, which is so fascinating um, that I, I thought if you wanted to, we'd go over a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd love to see what you found out. It seems like an odd um, statement. That's my interpretation is that I don't know if I'd ever put it on a job application or have any reason to consider it. It's just very weird. That's why it's here. <laughs> it's, very, <laughs> it's very unusual. Um, it is still to this day amazing to me how much information people give away when they speak or write freely. Um, sometimes the handwriting, it's done handwritten. Sometimes it's done on a computer. When it's handwritten, I, I will sometimes ask Steve Johnson to help take a look mm. at it after I'm done with it. But this one's really interesting. I have had good success being able to discern the language of addiction as well as the language of recovery. They speak mm. by two different people. So I always look for any type of forms of manipulation, but this one only took me about two minutes to do and I was done with it. The applicant, this is for a part-time, um, pretty much like a, an entry-level position, even though the subject was middle-aged. Oh, Just wow. like a part-time convenience store job. Over the years that I've been doing this, we've been able to reduce theft and hire some really good people and increase sales. It's worked out very well. And so I'm still with this client. She began with, okay. And we like to see people start with the pronoun I. We like them to be psychologically really committed to it. But okay is a form of agreement. And we see this sometimes on 911 calls of guilty callers who realize they're talking to police and they want to be seen as helpful. The need to be seen as helpful, it's the need to be seen rather than being helpful itself. So I saw okay with an exclamation point and I wondered a little bit about it. And she said, I'll start with I'm not perfect. And so Jim had mentioned before about the unnecessary information, and this is really important to us. So I had said at this point to myself, uh-oh, <laughs> if I could find someone who is being perfect to show me how I would ask for lessons. So there's a lot of words being used, and I haven't heard that she's good with cash registers or sales or something. Mm -hmm. Defensive. I, so it's not necessary because there is no one imperfect in this world. No mm -hmm. one. So I have this agreement. I'm worried about ingratiation. We call this the ingratiation factor where someone seeks to ingratiate themselves, which in a sense for a job, it's somewhat applicable. But this is her priority statement where she began. <clears throat> I'll start with I'm not perfect. Hey, no kidding. If I could find someone who is to show me See, it's not her fault, how I would be asked for lessons. So I'm considering someone that may be low on personal responsibility, one that's quick to blame others. I'm concerned mm -hmm. about that. I don't know, but I'm setting up for an interview. 
I've made a couple mistakes in life. Now, I know that she's middle-aged, and I know that we've all made lots of mistakes. <laughs> but then we have the minimization of not many. I mean, it's almost comical. And then this one. I'm a good person. Unless someone is under an accusation, when they make such a declaration, we generally find criminal or abusive behavior behind it. It's the need to persuade of some level of morality that is very dangerous. And um, I almost brought this up before. When we talk about uh, virtue signaling, especially if it's unnecessary and out of context, the person is screaming deficit. The protesters, Jim, when you mentioned that before, and you said, that's, you know, that's not my thing. Um, yes, there's a level of interest in a case, especially when cases that people feel lied to, like uh, the John Benet Ramsey, Madeline McCann, others. And there's a sense of, of insult because they may have been emotionally um, empathetic at first, but then they realize they're lied to, so they become bitter. But the protesters and people going out there, that's a whole new level. There's something lacking in their lives that they would go and harass someone like that uh, and to the point of, of yelling and screaming out their door. It's not going to bring justice. So I'm a good person is an indicator of something that's not good going on. I have a very funny sense of humor. I love to laugh, make others laugh. This is a job application. I have a sympathetic heart. So this is something that we would consider really quite good, but not on a job application. We like people with sympathetic hearts. Sure. And I humor. Care. Love humor. <laughs> I care deeply for even strangers. This is a dependent word, meaning there's a comparison going on, and she's elevating strangers, which shows that any hard times I suffered did not steal my light. And so I went like this with my little color coding. I don't hold any grudges. If I'm wrong, I admit it. If I'm not, I'm telling you as a future employer, employer, I will fight. I will fight. And so I just took that down. Is that okay? Whoa, it blew up. What happened? <laughs> okay, <laughs> leave it up. Okay. Um, or um, unless you're done with it, I mean. Yep, I was done with it. Okay. So what, what I said, but I didn't need to analyze this, this application for the client. I said, no interview, no interview for this one. What I learned was the sympathetic, kind-hearted, barely made any mistakes in life, not perfect person, had gone through at least, at least 12 elderly victims, robbing them by oh manipulating God. them of a tune of $120,000. Mm -hmm. no. Plus there was all sorts of other crimes, um, welfare fraud and uh, stolen physical items from different elderly. And law enforcement believes there's more victims than just that. So <laughs> the, God. yeah, the, so $120,000 from some of the most vulnerable people that we have are the elderly who can be very lonely and she is outgoing and she is personable like that. And she is manipulative and she is without empathy for them. Mm -hmm. That's what we learned. So she has ingrown eyeballs. All that matters is her and her circumstance. And uh, yeah, those, and those key words jump out, just jump out. Anytime I hear a spontaneous negation, <laughs> I get it. That gets my attention. I but, put it back up. Jim, should I put it back up? You can see it or. No, no, no. I, I, I read it with you guys and everything. So, yeah, it, it really, really, uh, she didn't talk about how she could do the job, the experience she's had at that job, nothing about the job. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm just, I, the whole thing is, it's like a non sequitur, I guess. It, it's like, you said that it was for like a convenience store or something. It'd be like, um, <laughs> I, I love customer service and I've always been the um, best yeah. bagger at the grocery right. stores that I've worked with my 10 years experience and managers always say I do a good job and I love to help people or, or something. I, I don't know. I would expect. I, I show up on time. I, <laughs> just very. Yeah. I want to represent. That's what I get all the time. 
<laughs> but it's weird. These, this one stood out because it's so extreme, but there's so many principles. Um, what I, and what I'm thinking about doing is I might, as an exercise, bring this to the team to go through it for the psychological profile. There's more. <laughs> that was only the first paragraph. I'm um, guessing. Yeah. I, she went on to, to describe a successful relative of mm. whom was not the applicant. <laughs> mm. um, wow. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pull some questions um, from uh, the chat. If you guys want to put some in, I'll randomly um, pick some out. Um, is there a difference if someone uses best version of me I can be or something versus I'm a good person in that context? I don't know. To me, that con there were, the context had no context, so it's just weird. Well, the context matters. So when we see, for example, you'd be very surprised how many intake applications at methadone clinics begin with, mm. I'm a really good mother. And what often that means is the child has been taken away. Sounds like a parole hearing. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be me, but it almost, you know, sounds like, you know, I'm a good mother. You should give me the opportunity to take care of my child and leave prison. Yeah, in a job application, you should give me, you should take a chance on me when someone's telling them that hire me is a chance. Now it's a chance for anyone, but having to say that will often cause me to go deeper into the background because of that very thing. Wow. I, I, I address job interviews in the book, uh, Control the Conversation, because mm -hmm. a job interview is just your ticket to ride. You've told them some basic information in your resume, uh, and, and and some people just go into a job interview and just recite what their resume says, and that's not enough. That's just your ticket to ride. That's just your foot in the door. And what you need to do is to tell them what you want them to know, not wait for them to even ask so much, but direct the conversation your way to get your information out. And uh, that's that's doesn't come easy because most people want to just answer the question and get through and hope for the best. But absolutely, uh, you need to, to tell them what they need to know, even if they don't even know to ask it, how you, mm -hmm. you are, what your experience is, and how you do the, your work uh, so that uh, it's, Most, uh, job, yeah. job applications are tough. Well, you're Most. trying to fit, right? You're, you're trying to say, okay, you, your company is a convenience store, and if you walk in and say, you know, you, you're the, the biggest convenience store in the area, you mm -hmm. do this, and if they could tell you about your business and mm -hmm. then how they will fit into the business, it's like, well, maybe I should work for them. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we do the same thing with law enforcement. We just take the, the context that the paradigm gets shifted way over, but we still look for some of the same things. Um, mm. One of the things with law enforcement is, can this person be trusted with lethal force carried in authority? Mm -hmm. Or do they need to be respected? Mm -hmm. They have some kind of craving, some deficit where they have a need to show up. There's a lot of good law enforcement around the country that absolutely love de-escalation, love mm -hmm. the good relationships with the community, rise to the, to the event when they have to, especially if something is dangerous, but they are emotionally satisfied at seeing people at peace. Mm -hmm. And there are those who, and it's, it's rare, but they are the ones that end up sticking out. Um, we've caught some of them in theft, in assaults, in different things that go on. It, and it's rare, but it happens. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty much the same thing, including those who have been trained. Please write out what happened. Sure. Here's a, a great question from the audience, and it makes me think of a Joe Navarro uh, tale that he tells. But uh, when someone's being interviewed and they're very nervous and anxious, does that automatically come off as a guilty vibe? Or is there something you can do to pinpoint the behavior to differentiate? And Joe Navarro tells a wonderful story about how they brought in a somebody who was going to be a witness or, you know, or potentially witness or whatever. And she just got in there and was just acting, just jittery and just guilty as can be. All kinds of knowledge, very incongruent, it didn't make any sense. And finally he asked her, he goes, you know, what's going on here? And she said, well, I didn't have a lot of change, and I'm worried the meter's going to run out. <laughs> so, and I thought that kind of applied here. What do you guys um, think about that situation? Because obviously, especially when you're talking about law enforcement or something, I mean, 
They're terrified. Go ahead. Peter. Oh, go ahead, Jeff, please. Okay, okay yeah. Uh, uh, there's no absolutes. I'm nervous when I come on with you, Eric, because I no. wonder if I'm going to have something worthwhile to say and, and uh, if I'm going to remember saying that, you know, I, I, I've been blessed with a good forgetter. And so sometimes <laughs> I, I don't even remember to talk about what I want to talk about or what I think. So I have so, that nervousness there. Then once we get started, then it, it, I calm down. If that person's nervous, uh, why? Why the nervous? Uh, maybe a really uh, reasonable reason. But if you don't find out why, if you don't talk about that, uh, and just take the 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 visual, that's that's not enough. And so that's that's where the the uh, armchair body language guy comes to play. Oh, she's nervous, so she must be guilty. No, no, nothing, nothing. It has to be. The baseline, it has to be understood. It has to be uh, looking for the, the incongruity, looking for the changes. Uh, there's no start off absolute anything. Uh, there's a, uh, oh God, I can't, uh, Hans Scharf. Is that, is that a, um, Hans Scharf is the, well, I hate to say, the World War II soldier from the Germans, because you can't say the four letter word in, ending with an I on YouTube. Um, would talk to POWs and would deliberately walk beside them or, or do things to throw them off guard. Is that something you might do is just set the environment to kind of see if the, they might settle down? Or Hans Scharf was the master interrogator of World War II for the, the, the German forces. And he knew how to make people comfortable when they weren't comfortable and take them out of a, maybe a, a jail cell and take them out of the interrogation booth with the light on, you know, the classic light and the, the you know, the, uh, the pounding on the table and all that stuff. And then just take them outside for a change of venue, a change of scenery. And and, and one thing that the a lot of our uh, service people didn't realize was the interrogation continues right out the door, right out to the woods, right out to the garden, right out to the restaurant, right out everywhere that it continues. It continues in the hospital because the nurses are, looking for information and they'll talk about anything in the rainbow to get to the point where they'll feel like there's no threat. And that's the best, that's the best function of a dysfunction <laughs> in that situation. Okay. Peter, the nervousness question. Well, I think the interview begins when someone walks in that door before anything's even said. Um, in my work, it was not interrogation. There's no threats. There's no, mm -hmm. um, it, it, civil investigation, meaning that it's all based on legally sound, open-ended questions. Uh, I just seek to try to make someone as comfortable as possible, uh, depending on, on the situation. At times, it's hard to articulate unless you're in that scenario and you can describe, because you, you get a quick read of someone, whether we read them correctly or not, it's, it's different, but a quick read of someone and, and see what they need to begin to relax. And I often try to put the burden of information upon them, talk as little as possible. And even if it reaches a point where I have to draw a conclusion without you, it's much better for you to talk for yourself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll get them a glass of water or, or walk around a little bit or just little things like that. But mostly it's just, for me, it's the, the language I'm listening for. How, how about in statement analysis though? Like when you're reading a, like a long transcript or something, do you just, can you sometimes, or do you sometimes have to say, all right, they may be really nervous here in the first five pages or this amount of time and, and account for that. that. That's kind of where I was going with, you know, my thoughts on the question is later on, you're not talking to them directly, but you are looking at statements and they might be, you know, jibber jabbery. I, I don't know how to put it, but you know, they're nervous and can act in a different manner and then settle down over time. Sure, and if someone has a, a criminal history and they've, they've done time before, they are already on edge. They're already under an accusation, mm -hmm. whether I recognize it or not. So they're gonna have a defensive posture and nervousness with that. Um, we still look for the words they choose to use and where the pace of the information changes dramatically. And everyone's a little bit different, but we look for a change. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Siggy. That's a good question, though. 
Um, this is probably a good one to close out on, actually, because I love stories. And uh, this hopefully will lead to stories. Were there, and this is for both of you, was there ever a case you were certain of a guilt or we'll say innocence? Because it could go either way. You know, the, the key thing is that you had um, a presumption of something. Nobody else saw what you saw or didn't agree, but ultimately you were proven right. I will start with Jim. Well, you have to give me some more time to think about this. <laughs> Your forgetter's working. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to I have to, to run a lot of, you know, I've got a lot of years here that i got to run through. So okay, okay. give me a minute on that. Peter. Um, I never went on a branch alone, so I'm always having someone else check my work and with others. So that, fortunately, that's not a, that's not happened to me. The one time that I did think I was wrong, um, I took the analysis on a road trip, uh, different law enforcement agencies, and I had others do the work for me, and I always came back with the same response. And then I happened to be in a location, uh, which I didn't realize where some of the actual investigators of that case were present. And they took me aside and said, we can't go into de too much detail, you're not wrong. The case was closed too, too quickly. But generally speaking, I, I don't work alone. I always have someone check my work. I don't trust myself. Hmm. Jim, you come up with one? Well, no, but what I've, I'm going to okay. bring to you is that, um, there's going to be some more discussion with Don Wells and with the the Candace, the, the mother, mm. and uh, some things are going to be up. There's more to to what we have here, so that uh, this is kind of a, a being played out in front of us as we speak. Mm -hmm. We have our feelings of what we think might have happened or who might be involved, and we will find out if we're wrong or right if we were uh, you know following a, a shiny object down the the path and miss the whole point but uh, we're all doing this right now as we speak making judgments and what will happen is we will find out eventually the truth eventually the outcome uh it doesn't look good it doesn't look well and uh, I, I i'm not prepared to say that it's going to be an okay outcome out of the crew. I don't believe that for a minute, but uh, we're doing it right now as we speak, making these judgments on the, the Petito situation, the, the Summer Wells situation. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a current event that, that will take us all to that place of were we right? Were we wrong? Why were we right? Why were we wrong? And that's really the most important part of it is why. And then we can learn from it and apply it uh, for other cases. Unfortunately, that will come down the, the road. Yeah, great point. The really sad thing is the one thing you're certain of pretty early is um, it's not going to be a good outcome. Yeah. yeah. And all of these, I mean, I think, I think just about every armchair expert to real expert could see that with Gabby Petito situation that mm -hmm. she was missing. They had this. This is not going to end well. Don't know what happened or why, but you just know it wasn't. It didn't end well. And Summer Greg, Wells, did yeah. not. It's not ending well. You just know that. Greg Hartley said to to the public, he says, whenever you have a physical relationship with 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 people leave to go now because it never ends well it, it, it never mm -hmm. never de-escalates it always escalates and of course never never is always always but but still that's when it gets physical it's time to go but it's it's not that's easier said than done but that's the first time to to reassess a relationship oh totally agree Matt, good good point to uh, end on and um, sad point to end on, but it's good advice. I, I, you know, I, if, yeah. if you wouldn't want this to happen to somebody else, don't sit there yourself in it, you know, it, be kind to yourself. Yeah. I, I think that would be a good one. Just look yeah. out for yourself. Like you would somebody else. Mm -hmm. If you don't think somebody else should be treated in the manner you're treated, then take care of yourself. Absolutely. Uh, thank you both so much.
love to have you both back and maybe we could explore something or look over footage or revisit uh what's going on right now okay yeah yeah maybe after we get back we can talk about you know what's going on with this these situations and how we assessed it and how we uh, invested in it peter are you up for that yeah it'd be great all right well thank you both this has been fantastic i know the chat um loves hearing from you guys and I'm really, really honored to have you. Thank you very much.